Hello and welcome everyone to this final podcast for transcription. In this podcast, we're going to talk about RNA modification and more specifically modification that occurs to the messenger RNA. Modifications happen to the other RNA molecules as well, but we're just going to talk about messenger RNA modification. I want to start back with our dear friend, the central dogma, where you go from DNA to RNA to protein. We've talked about the process where we get RNA. We talked mainly about messenger RNA, but the general phenomenon is for all the RNA. Now before it can become a protein, sometimes it needs to be modified. And this is true primarily in eukaryotes. So I'm going to write modification and then eukaryotes. One reason that the bacteria don't require modification is that if this were our bacterial cell here, and we had our DNA here, remember there's no nucleus, it's all in the cytoplasm, the RNA polymerase could be bound here making messenger RNA, the 5' prime coming out here, while it's making this messenger RNA continuously, ribosomes could attach to this messenger RNA and begin making protein. More importantly, you could imagine multiple ribosomes attached here, all making proteins at the same time. And because of this, as that messenger RNA is being made, it's ready to be translated immediately by the ribosomes. Nothing more has to happen to it. Again, this is because this all occurs in the cytoplasm. And remember, E. coli bacteria are incredibly efficient, right? They have to be able to adapt quickly to a rapidly changing environment. And this is one of the many ways that they can do that. Again, as we've said before, eukaryotes are a little bit more complicated in the way they turn on and off genes and eventually get to that protein they need. So let's draw a eukaryotic cell. And I'm going to draw a rather large nucleus just so we have room to draw inside of it. In this nucleus, we have our DNA. And this DNA can be bound to our ribosomal, I'm sorry, our RNA polymerase. And it can make our RNA molecule. This RNA molecule now is stuck in the nucleus. It can't be translated until it gets into the cytoplasm because the cytoplasm is where the ribosomes are that are needed to translate the messenger RNA to proteins. Getting this messenger RNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm to be translated, it has to be processed. And we're going to talk about all of these things, but a few things that happen is it gets shorter because these sequences that are called introns have to be removed. Again, you don't have to write that down yet because we're going to spend a, a little bit more time talking about that. This is just giving you an overview. overview. Next, this RNA molecule at the 5' prime end gets a modified guanine put on it. We call it the G cap. And then at the 3' prime end, it gets a long poly A tail attached to it. At this point, this modified RNA can leave the nucleus and attach to these ribosomes and begin making proteins. But before we can do that, it has to be modified. And so that's what we're going to spend the rest of this podcast talking about is this part here, this modification of the messenger RNA. And so there will be four things we're going to talk about. One will be splicing. That's what we talked about here, going from a longer piece of RNA to a smaller one. We splice out those introns. The second thing we'll want to talk about is putting on that G cap and why it's important to do that. Then we'll want to talk about the poly A tail. How it's, is that put on and why is that important? And then we want to talk about one other really cool thing that happens in eukaryotic cells and that's called RNA editing. 
We didn't talk about it with this picture here, but we'll come back to it. Essentially, all, all it means is this messenger RNA that was coded for by this D, DNA, the gene here, can now be changed so that it is actually making a different protein than what the genetic code said. All right, so let's begin with splicing. Early on, in the early 1900s, scientists came up with this idea called collinearity. And essentially what this said was, if you have a piece of DNA with, say, three genes, then that's going to make three different proteins. This gene A will make protein A, this gene B will make protein B, and then gene C here will make protein C. There was a linear relationship between the number of genes and the number of proteins. We believe there needed to be roughly about as many genes as there were proteins. And we knew, well, early in the 1900s or mid-1900s, they knew there were hundreds of thousands of proteins in a cell. So they reasoned there had to probably be about that many genes. When I was a college student, I was taught that there were about 100,000 genes. Now we know, since this genome has been sequenced, that there's only 20,000 genes. So this idea of collinearity is a nice idea, and in some organisms, like E. coli, it holds up to be true, but in more derived organisms, like humans, flies, multicellular eukaryotes, it doesn't exactly hold up to be true. And that is because we know that we get many more proteins than the number of genes made. All right, so let's go ahead and erase this and talk about some the first piece of evidence they had that some kind of modification had to be happening to the RNA molecules. They knew if they took a single strand of DNA, and with E. coli, if they mixed that with the RNA, that what they would get was this DNA molecule binding nicely to the exact gene it was on. So this suggested that the RNA was coded by this gene and the sequences aligned nicely between the DNA and the messenger RNA that was made. Made for a nice story. Then eukaryotes started coming along as people started studying the messenger RNA in eukaryotes and they found something a little different. They found that if you took the single-stranded DNA, which of course contained the genes on it, and mixed that with the messenger RNA that they found in the cytoplasm, what they discovered was that when the messenger RNA bound to the DNA, it only bound to certain regions of it. The DNA formed these loops. Now why is that? It bound to these regions, which marks a part of the gene. These regions out here were just outside of the gene, so that's okay. But why did it loop out like this? Something in the middle of this gene that was in the gene, in the DNA, somehow or another did not end up in the final messenger RNA. What a mystery they had on their hand. They had no idea what was going on. Well, we now know what's going on. It's because this part of the gene has to be cut out of the messenger RNA. It has to be spliced out. So I'm going to erase this real quick. So a eukaryotic gene contains a combination of exons and introns. Exons are part of that mature messenger RNA. They are part of the coding sequence. They contain the nucleotide sequence necessary to make that protein. Introns, non-coding. And it, it must be removed from that messenger RNA. So a typical gene is going to have several exons and several introns. A typical eukaryotic gene, I should say. So I'm going to put E1 for exon 1. Then I'm going to put intron in 1, exon 2 intron 2, exon 3, and we'll just stop there. We know through the process of transcription 
TXN transcription that the messenger RNA that is initially made looks just like the DNA. It's got intron 1, exon, I'm sorry, exon 1, intron 1, exon 2, intron 2, exon 3. And then what happens is the introns are removed and we call that splicing. And so we end up with a mature product that has exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3. We've removed the intron. So you can see how in that experiment that you just saw before I erased it, how if we place this in the same tube as the full DNA, the gene, that this E1 is going to match here, this E2 will match here, this E3 will match here. And the reason they're matching is because they are complementary following Shargaff's rules, right? The sequences here match up here, 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 here. And so you would see something like this if we mix these together. Where this part would be exon 1, this would be exon 2, and this would be exon 3, whereas the loop part is intron 1 and intron 2. Now, one time is part of this initial messenger RNA, but by the time it gets to the cytoplasm and exits the nucleus, it has already removed these intron sequences. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these introns before we move on to how they're spliced out. So introns. Most eukaryotic genes have them. Okay? So eukaryotic genes have introns. They may have between 8 to more than 60. The length of the introns could be as few as 200 base pairs to as many as 50,000 base pairs. Often these genes, their introns in them, are much larger than the exons. We know they are very rare in bacteria. Rare in bacteria. And we know that we find them in mitochondria, so present in mitochondria and chloroplast. As kind of an interesting example, let me write it up here. The dystrophin gene that's associated with muscular dystrophy has 79 exons. These exons only make up about 0.6% of that gene, of the dystrophin gene, meaning 99.4% of the whole dystrophin gene is introns. And those introns have to be removed before the dystrophin gene is functional. So the question that must be making your head explode right now is why? Why do we carry such a large amount of introns in our genes simply for the purpose of removing them before we can have a functional messenger RNA? At the surface it seems incredibly inefficient. Yet, I'll tell you, and we've already alluded to this before, these introns that seem to be just hanging around, not having much purpose at all, are in reality the reason humans are the way they are, the reason Drosophila are the way they are. They account for the diversity that we see within organisms. We'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about gene expression, but for now just recognize that these introns, though massive and take up a large portion of our genome, are incredibly important. You'll have to come back later to get here the, the end of the story. So how are these introns removed? Let's talk a little bit about this. Splicing. They can be removed all by themselves, so to speak, meaning they are self-splicing. Now it doesn't just magically pop out. There is a mechanism that occurs to allow these introns to move out, but there are no 
proteins that need to bind to remove it when we say they're self-splicing. What we want to talk about are the ones that utilize this really cool spliceosome, which is a complex of proteins. So the spliceosome equals proteins and RNAs. More specifically, these SN RNAs that we talked about a couple podcasts ago, small nuclear RNAs. Together, these proteins and small nuclear RNAs of the spliceosomes are called, one of my favorite words in genetics, SNRPs. S-N-R-N-P-S, SNRPs for proteins plus small nuclear RNAs. These make up the spliceosome that remove the introns. Now, how do they remove the introns? Well, let's draw a fairly simple RNA here with just one intron. So we have an exon 1 here, we have an exon 2 here, and then we have our intron. There are three critical sites. The first one right here is our 5' prime splice site. Over here is our 3' prime splice site. And then in the middle of the intron is something called the branch point. These are really the three central parts that are necessary to remove the intron. And though I'm not going to draw it on here because then you wouldn't see what was happening, the entire spliceosome containing these SNRPs binds around this. And all of what I'm about to explain happens within the confines of the spliceosomes. So the first thing happen is, happens is that the 5' prime slide, splice site is cleaved. So you have this exon 1, like so, and over here, this intron and exon 2 are attached. Now they are just free floating in the cy splices, I mean in the cytoplasm, or in, I should say, <coughs> Now these aren't just free floating in the nucleus, rather they are being held in place by the spliceosome. The next thing that happens is that as this exon 1 is just waiting for the rest of it to happen, this intron, by the, this 5' prime end of this intron, comes over and hits this branch point. And what forms then is what we call a lariat, kind of like the lasso that you might see in a western. So this intron forms a lariat. Here's our exon 2. Next thing that happens is this 3' prime splice site is cleaved. And this lariat that contains the intron is degraded. So we'll get rid of that. And remember, again, this is all occurring within that spliceosome. And so what happens now is different parts of that spliceosome bring these two together, the two exons together, and we end up with a mature messenger RNA that has exon 1 and exon 2 right here, with the intron removed. And this is the messenger RNA that is now ready to make a protein. Okay, now we want to talk about two other things, G-capping and the poly A tail. Here's our gene world famous gene with the RNA polymerase making the messenger RNA and here comes the messenger RNA coming off of here remember it's created where the 5 prime end comes off first as soon as that 5 prime, five prime end comes off that ribosome it wouldn't even wait this long as you see drawn here as soon as it pokes its little head out with exposing that 5 prime end it's immediately modified and how is it modified added to this 5' prime in is a modified guanine. Essentially to this 5' prime phosphate we add this guanine at its phosphate end in such a way that the two phosphates bind to each other. So you have a 5' prime phosphate from one guanine, I'll put G here for one guanine, binding to the 5' prime phosphates 
that is the first nucleotide that comes off there. 5' prime phosphate of 5' prime N. This creates an unusual bond, but it's, it's incredibly stable as well. In addition to this complex, additional guanines are added. Plus 2 to 7 guanines are added to the cap here. So what you end up with, once this messenger RNA is completely made, which we're not quite there yet, it has this large guanine cap on the end of it. I'm going to erase this here, at least part of it here, so we can talk about why it's important to have this guanine cap. Okay, now let's talk about the functions of this G cap. So G cap functions. First, it functions to initiate translation, and it does so by binding ribosomes. Two, stability output. You know how we talked about that rat protein that can bind to the five prime ends of RNA molecules. Well, if this G-cap didn't bind to the five prime end, it would begin to rat would be able to bind to it and degrade that. So that G-cap does help protect the RNA from being degraded. When we talked about removing introns, we we didn't mention this, or I didn't mention this, but this G-cap. helps remove the first, only the first, but the first intron. And lastly, the G-cap functions in helping RNA exit the nucleus. So for all these reasons, the G-cap is important. Next, I want to talk about what happens at the 3' prime end of the messenger RNA. So as this RNA polymerase moves down and it terminates it by one of the mechanisms, the allosteric or the torpedo mechanism, it doesn't matter which, the messenger RNA is removed. But remember, one thing we did say is, is that it always cleaves after the site that we call the polyadenylation site. So we have our G-cap here, and at this polyadenylation site, what happens is some of this will be removed, and then we add a string of adenines here. This, the number of adenines can be anywhere from 50 to 250 adenines. It's not added with a template, so we're up to now when we talk about making RNA or DNA, there's always a template. But this adds these sequences in a similar way that the telomerase does, but it uses an enzyme called poly-A polymerase. So it's an enzyme that will specifically, at this poly-A site, add additional adenines. It has some similar functions as the G-cap, but let's go ahead and list the functions of the poly-A tail, or why they're important. It also uh, functions in stability. You can make a rough estimate to how long that messenger RNA is going to be in the cytoplasm, once it gets to the cytoplasm, based upon how many adenines are at the end. More adenines means the RNA will be around for a longer period of time. Fewer adenines, it will be around for a shorter period of time. It protects this three prime end, and so the more that are there, the greater the protection. It also plays a role in ribosome attachment. So the three things we talked about, removing the introns, adding the G-cap, and now adding the poly-A tail, are the three kinds of modifications that has to happen to that messenger RNA before it can leave the nucleus. So you can think of the original RNA molecule, like so, before it's modified, and then the new mod newly modified form is going to be shorter because it has the introns removed, and it's going to have a G-cap at the end, and then a poly-A tail at the three prime end. And now it can leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm and be translated into a protein. Now there's one last thing we need to talk about and that is 
this thing called RNA editing. Now this idea really put the central dogma to a test. Because remember, the central dogma says you start off with DNA, the DNA codes for an RNA, and now that RNA makes a protein. What RNA editing does is says that we get this RNA that's coded by the DNA, and now we're going to change it. We're going to edit it in such a way that we make a protein that is different than what the DNA codes for. So this was really revolutionary. So you have your messenger RNA here, and it's in the cytoplasm, and we're going to really simplify what's happening here. There is this new kind of RNA that we haven't talked about yet. I'm going to draw like this. It's called the guide RNA. And what the guide RNA does is it will combine with the mature RNA here and change the sequence of it. It doesn't change it drastically, it just changes it a little so that the RNA that is now made has a few modifications in it. But these modifications are huge. They can create a completely different protein. And I really want to stress how why this is so revolutionary. Because this was the first, I think it was the first, I don't think there was anything before this, that said that the final protein that is made with this RNA through translation is not the protein that this gene, that the gene originally coded, that this original messenger RNA was carrying with it. It got changed by this guide RNA in the cytoplasm, so a new protein was made. After this, their discovery, I'm going to erase this side here, after their discovery, various diseases were being linked to RNA editing, or failures in RNA editing. Some of these diseases, diseases were depression, epilepsy, schizophrenia, and some viruses will take advantage of these guide RNAs to produce proteins that the virus needs. Okay, that's all we have for this podcast on RNA editing, so let's give a quick summary. And instead of a written summary, what I want to do is just draw a summary here. Remember, we provided three kinds of editing. Four kinds if we count the guide RNA. So you have your DNA here, and we make our RNA. And now this RNA has to be processed. So we're going to go processing. And it's processed in one of three ways. Splicing, get rid of those introns, adding that G cap, and adding the poly, poly A tail, polyadenylated tail. And then what we have here is going to be the mature protein with a guanine cap on it. What we're going to have in here is the mature RNA with the 5 prime G cap and then this poly A tail at the 3 prime end. Make sure you understand the functions of these modifications. What does splicing do? How does that change the protein that would be produced? What might be the advantages or disadvantages of all these introns? What does the G cap do? What does the poly A cap do? And then finally, we talked about how RNA editing can further change this protein, I'm sorry, this RNA in such a way that we'll introduce different sequences to this messenger RNA in the cytoplasm. All right, that's all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you let me know, and I'll be happy to help in any way I can. See you in class. Bye.